Wells Carroll and Wilkins, the senior deputy governor of the Bank of Canada. Uh, Ms. Wilkins is going to begin. Thank you. Um, and can everybody please make sure that their cell phones are uh, muted or whatever it is that you do with them. Thanks. Good morning. Governor Polatz and I are pleased to be here to talk about today's interest rate announcement and our monetary policy report. Before we turn to your questions, let me just take a couple of minutes to give you an idea of the most important issues that came up during Governing Council's discussions. We started by noting some very positive developments. The Canadian economy continues to operate near its capacity and growth is relatively broad based across sectors and regions. Meanwhile, inflation is close to our target. So what stands out is that even with today's in increase in the policy rate to 1.75%, monetary policy remains stimulative. In fact, the policy rate today is still negative in real terms. That is, once you adjust for inflation. Given this context, it's natural that our discussion centered on the main factors driving economic activity and inflation over our projection horizon and the appropriate pace for returning the policy rate to a neutral stance. Now let me remind you that our estimate of neutral is in a range, currently 2.5 to 3.5%. It's a range rather than a point estimate because the neutral rate is unobservable and it can change over time. So let me talk about our assessment of inflation developments. Inflation was running near the upper end of our 1 to 3 percent target range in July and August, a little higher than we had expected in our July monetary policy report. And as we said in our last interest rate announcement in September, the staff, the staff assessment was that most of this surprise came from one component of the consumer price index, that's airfares. They judged that this component would be volatile over coming months because of methodological changes that Statistics Canada put in place. Well, the staff were right. The most recent data released just last Friday showed that inflation fell back to 2.2 percent in September, due in large part to a reversal in the airfare component. We could see further volatility from this component in coming months. Importantly, our core measures of inflation remain firmly around 2 percent. This is consistent with an economy that is operating at capacity. This episode shows just how critical it is to distinguish between the volatile elements of inflation and more persistent underlying pressures. Labor markets are so far showing little signs of wage pressures. Even with the unemployment rate near its lowest point in 40 years, underlying wage growth is running at around 2.3 percent. Now this is a backward-looking indicator and we project wage growth to pick up in the year ahead. Companies that we spoke to in our autumn business outlook survey expect that wage gains will pick up over the coming quarters. They also told us that capacity pressures remain elevated and that labor shortages are increasing. Council spent a considerable amount of time discussing the implications of the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement. The USMCA is good news because it will reduce an important source of uncertainty that had been holding back business investment. Remember that we've been marking down our investment outlook because of this uncertainty. We know from our latest business outlook survey, which was completed before the agreement was reached, that business investment plans were already quite positive. Firms told us that they were looking to increase capacity and productivity to take advantage of strong US, U.S. economy. And so, given the agreement, we've reversed some of the markdown of investment. To be prudent, we didn't remove all of it because we want to see how firms actually adjust their investment plans. This prudence is also because we know that competitiveness challenges continue to weigh on investment. 
The approval of the LNG project on the West Coast adds to the good economic news, although its impact is somewhat offset by lower commodity prices. Overall, the projected investment profile is higher than it was in July, increasing both actual growth and the economy's potential to expand in a non-inflationary way. However, the protectionist trade actions, particularly those involving the United States and China, were also top of mind for us as they continue to weigh on the global outlook. We have incorporated in our forecast the expected effects of tariffs imposed to date. And we have also incorporated the dampening effects on confidence that uh, uh, come from threats of future measures. All told, we estimate that uh, these, um, this amounts to a drag on the global economy of 0.3% by the end of 2020. Now that is a big cost as it adds up to more than U.S. $200 billion. This represents a two-sided risk for Canadian monetary policy. There is a possibility that the United States and China will find a path to ease or resolve this trade conflict. This would be positive for global trade and investment, and for Canada. However, the conflict could also worsen, and this would jeopardize important global value chains. And of course, this would surely reduce long-term growth and prosperity globally. However, the overall implications for inflation would be uncertain. Closer to home, Governing Council has been assessing how people are adapting to both higher interest rates and the changes to mortgage underwriting guidelines implemented earlier this year. We've seen that households are adjusting their budgets largely as expected. We understand that this can be difficult, particularly for those who are highly indebted. At the same time, employment and incomes continue to grow, which can help to cushion the adjustment process. Further, the quality of new debt is improving and housing activity is moderating to a more sustainable level. All of this is making the economy more resilient and reduces the chances of painful outcomes for many people further down the road. The rule changes also appear to have helped take the wind out of the sails of speculators in some markets, which reduces the pressure on housing affordability. Overall, while financial system vulnerabilities are still elevated, the fact that they have stabilized and edged down in a number of respects is positive. There's an updated analysis of these household issues in box four of the monetary policy report, and a more detailed uh, staff analytical note will be published about the effects of the underwriting guidelines on borrowing on the financial system hub that will be launched in a couple of weeks. The hub is designed to be a place on our website where we can post our analysis of current financial system vulnerabilities and risks in a manner that is accessible to a wide audience. Given all these factors, Governing Council agrees that the policy interest rate will need to rise to a neutral stance in order to achieve the inflation target. You may have noticed that we haven't used the word gradual to describe the pace of monetary policy adjustments. This is to avoid the impression that we, were, that we are following a preordained or mechanical policy path. The appropriate pace for interest rate increases will be, depend on Governing Council's assessment at each fixed announcement date of how the outlook for inflation and related risks are evolving. In particular, Governing Council will continue to take into account how the economy is adjusting to higher interest rates given the elevated level of household debt. While the focus of many commentators tends to be on the downside risks, it's also possible that strong consumer confidence builds on solid job and income growth and leads to greater than expected consumption. We will also pay close, pay close, close attention to global trade policy developments and their implications for the inflation outlook. Again, we need to bear in mind that this risk is two-sided. 
And with that, Governor Polatz and I would be happy to take your questions. All right, I already have a list here, uh, so if I haven't uh, pointed at you or whatever, then and you want to be on the list, now's the time to uh, make your move. Um, we'll start, and I'm going to apologize for butchering your name again. Uh, Royal uh, Vandenet from Epoch Times. Yes, hi, uh, good afternoon, good morning. Um, just regarding the uh, threat to global growth and the Canadian economy coming from China, dealing with the uh, trade war with the U.S., um, seeing the big decline in their stock market and currency, um, do you see this? Uh, I know you mentioned the, the two-sided aspect of it, but do you, do you see this in terms of like the potential for something uh, much worse, uh, given that the Trump administration and the allies are, are trying to, you know, put pressure on China to clean up their act in international trade and and so so. But but do you see that as being the the, uh, the downside case for the, the the Chinese economy if it tries to, you know, react to that and what it can do? I'll take that. Sure. Um, well, this this fact is that. Uh, uh, trade actions, such as the ones we've already seen, uh, are well known uh, in the economics literature and from history to slow economic growth, not just in the countries that are affected, but globally, especially given how integrated economies have become. This is uh, the principal reason why, uh, well, why the IMF downgraded its uh, outlook, and it's why we've downgraded our uh, global outlook. Um, and it's to take account of the actions that have already taken place. Uh, the threats of even more extreme actions, of course, makes that, that risk a larger risk. The way this normally works uh, would be that uh, on both sides there's an escalation of, of those uh, tariffs. And uh, that will, of course, raise prices for everybody. And it slows economic growth. And it will slow growth in the two principal engines uh, of the global economy. Um, and that, of course, then has spillovers for everybody else. And so for, our, for here in Canada, the main thing, what we see already, is lower commodity prices, uh, which is a shift downwards in Canada's terms of trade. Uh, but as time goes on, it would be more like uh, a slowdown in our export growth because our principal trading partners were, were slowing. Uh, we see the, the market turmoil, if we call it that, as you, you referred to it, but corrections in the stock markets as a symptom of this, this underlying cause, but also, you know, a more, more basic uh, issue, which is that the, the global economy is normalizing mm -hmm. and monetary policy is moving to a more neutral stance in many places. Uh, and as that happens, the, the relative pricing between stocks and bonds generally will adjust. And that's often a, a volatile kind of uh, process. And so volatility measures have gone up. And I, I think that that's, you know, the, the more likely uh, cause of what we've been seeing. But, uh, you know, these markets are far, far, far forward looking. And, uh, and so, of course, they're watching very closely the, the developments in that trade conflict. So we, we highlight it as our, our, our primary risk to the global outlook and therefore for Canada. But what we have to do is acknowledge, as uh, Ms. Wilkins just said in her opening remarks, that the, these are two-sided risks because it's entirely possible to see a negotiated uh, de-escalation um, in short order, uh, which would convert that into more lift for the U.S. economy and the Chinese economy and for everybody else at the time, same time. So was, uh, if we were traders in the financial markets, we would be free to choose one of those narratives and say, that's my narrative and I'm going to position around it. But as a central banker, we cannot. We need to take account of both of those uh, range of possibilities and, in effect, uh, choose some middle ground, which hedges both of those, those risks appropriately. That is exactly what we mean by risk management. I mean, do, do you see, uh, in terms of the, the levers that the Chinese authorities can pull to uh, sort of uh, reduce the impact of the uh, trade war, it seems China is taking it you know, worse than the, than the U.S. Are, are there concerns that you have about them, you know, like exacerbating financial vulnerabilities and the debt and that longer term having bigger impacts for Canada? I mean, maybe it's, it's a bit of a longer term issue, but it seems very uh, tricky with, with, with the situation China faces if they do more accommodation. 
So, so China is, and before the trade uh, conflicts started to escalate, was already uh, looking at its high level of leverage and financial stability issues, uh, and also the fact that potential output growth was slowing, uh, and pivoting towards uh, an economy with lower leverage and, and less uh, reliance on investment and more on domestic consumption. And, and of course, uh, they had started off the year with taking some very decisive actions to bring leverage down, and you can see that, that those actions have, have worked. Now with the trade conflict, it's making that that balancing act a little bit more difficult. They do have levers. Um, they just most re recently changed the reserve requirements. Uh, they have some fiscal space. They have other space on the on the monetary policy side, and so and so it's up to them to uh, strike that that proper balance. And our base case uh, with growth in the Chinese economy of around six percent is is that they will be able to do that. I think the risk is the one that you identified. If there's further escalation, uh, it just makes that balancing act more and more difficult. Kevin Carmichael, The Financial Post. Uh, judging by your statement, uh, you probably anticipated a certain reaction in financial markets to the absence of gradual in the statement, uh, which has been being interpreted as hawkish and suggesting that the central bank's uh, pace, at least, of raising interest rates has sped up. But could you address that uh, as clearly as you can? Has anything changed? Uh, today, or is anything different today than than a couple of months ago? Is is, is the, the pace to uh, to a neutral rate uh, faster today than it was uh, two months ago, I guess, is the question. You know, what we were seeing uh, is that, is that uh, there was a quite a focus on a single word, gradual, to kind of encapsulate all the things that Governing Council considers when deciding what's the appropriate level for the overnight rate. And we felt that that it was the right time to be clear, in fact, about what was on our minds. And we were clear in a couple of ways in terms of talking about, uh, you know, moving to uh, a neutral range, a neutral stance for monetary policy. So that tells markets and households a little bit about the destination, which I think is is uh, quite clear. Uh, and then with respect to the pace, we're also clear about what's on our mind. And I won't repeat what I said in in the in. The the statement. So, so what it does mean is that every decision is a decision, and yes, it's possible that the pace uh, could be a bit faster, but it's also possible that it could be a bit slower because, I, as I said, the risks are two-sided and will be dis decidedly data-dependent, uh, and we're hoping that uh, participants in the markets and households will be doing the same thing. Uh, follow up to that. Are the headwinds facing the Canadian economy today weaker than they were uh, a couple of months ago? Certainly, the headwind that was coming from the uncertainty with respect to trade policy, the the, the NAFTA, uh, has has uh, come down. As as uh, we've mentioned in the monetary policy report in the statement, uh, it's prudent to to uh, to watch the data. So we've taken off some of our our downward uh, adjustments to the the inflation forecast relative to what our model would say, uh, because we anticipate that businesses will will uh, become more confident. But, you know, we want to be prudent in terms of the timing of that and, and, and actually see the data. Uh, in terms of the other headwinds, so you can see that, that uh, households are adjusting. We were wondering about how the, house, the housing sector would adjust to the B20 changes as well as other municipal and, and provincial measures in, in particular markets. And the analysis that we see... Uh, you know, you, you always need to see more data because it's still relatively early, early days, but they seem to be adjusting uh, as we had expected. Housing markets seem to be stabilizing and at a lower level uh, and probably a more sustainable level, and we're carrying that through the projection as well. So so those are the those are some of the changes. Yes, there are risks to the outlook. Do you want to call those headwinds? Uh, they're on both sides, coming from the trade uh, and, and, uh, and other things, as we've listed in the report. Greg Quinn, Bloomberg. I wondered why you mentioned interest rates need to rise just to neutral. Are you trying to signal that, that there's kind of a, a cap on how far you, you're going to go here? 
Well, I wouldn't uh, describe it as a cap, but it's uh, an expectation based on our projection that, uh, in effect, uh, the economy has converged on its potential level at a potential growth rate with inflation on target. So basically what we're talking about is the last element of that normalization process, getting home, as we've described it. And, uh, you know, until some um, new shock uh, throws us off of that uh, trajectory, uh, we wouldn't be expecting to be going into a, uh, a contractionary uh, stance uh, for policy. Uh, but we, what we do know today is that we are still being quite stimulative at a time when the economy really does not seem to need it, except for, as uh, as was just mentioned, perhaps the, there are there are some lingering adjustment processes ongoing. So that's what makes it a a, a process of you know data dependence, so that we're making sure that uh, we're taking full account of all those adjustments as we go forward, and not being mechanical about a return to neutral. Uh, I wonder why you're reluctant to say that we're at full output, that we're close to it. You know, unemployment is the lowest in, in decades. You know, inflation went up to 3%. Uh, the, the big risk of, of NAFTA being replaced is gone. What's, you know, why are you still of the view that we're sort of being held back here on, on, in the economy? Well, uh, by our estimates, we say uh, near potential or near capacity it could as easily be above as below. We are, we are in a zone which we define as uh, you know, a rather a statistical zone, if you like, of where potential is, where capacity is. It's not an observable variable. Uh, so those those estimates suggest that we're you know we, we're you know in the zone of plus or minus one percent of of capacity, and so in that uh, situation, you're just as likely to have a positive shock give rise to a forward-looking inflation risk as a negative shock give you uh, a, a risk of lower inflation in the future. So so we call that near capacity. That doesn't mean almost at capacity. Mm -hmm. It means in the zone where it could just as easily be zero excess capacity. We look at, uh, you know, that's from the production space. So if we look at uh, the labor market, sure, there are still uh, features of the labor market that suggest there may be pockets of capacity. But I think our most important uh, remaining uh, area of expansion is through productivity. We're at the stage of the business cycle where normally investment would have been stronger were it not for uh, the uncertainty around the future of NAFTA. And that would have been building a little more capacity into the economy and allowing exports to grow faster into the bargain. And so we would still be watching for that phenomenon to take place. And uh, that would in include labor market churn so as people find uh, find the right role for them using all of their skills and so you get a higher productivity lift from that and probably the re the increased re-entry into the labor force from the bottom you know in uh, especially in the youth category so those are those are kind of the remaining dynamics that we're watching closely those stories haven't gone away it's just that there's not much new to tell about them at this stage uh, when we get the next set of national accounts, you know, uh, I mean, we'd be looking at the investment numbers closely to see how we're doing with that. And the next set of revisions will be next spring. That gives us more of historical context for those big questions. Kim McCrell, Wall Street Journal. Thanks. Uh, in the statement, you talked about uh, the Bank of Canada looking at household vulnerabilities as it considers the pace of future rate increases. Can you be a little more specific about what you're looking for in that and what kind of deterioration in household vulnerabilities would cause the bank to give some pause to um, the pace of rate increases? So, so uh, what we look at uh, when we see how they're adjusting is on, on, on two plans. One is just uh, how we think uh, the mortgage costs for people who have mortgages uh, are going to adjust. And you will recall in our July monetary policy report, we were quite granular in showing uh, that giving examples of people who originated their mortgage in 2014 or 2015, what kind of rate uh, increase uh, they might be they might be facing. Uh, 
and uh, and how that would affect their debt to service ratio, which is in real time something that people are concerned about in terms of how they need to adjust their budgets. And we continue to do that. And what we find is is pretty much the same in that in that uh, the the increases that they've seen so far, especially for people, and this is above the people with the mortgages that are not highly indebted, uh, those increases in the debt to surface ratio are either very small or to the extent that they're not they're quite manageable relative to to their incomes. Where we see uh, that it's that it's more difficult is for those who are highly indebted. So those who are, um, have loan to income ratios greater than 450 percent. So so we pay pretty close attention to that, and we've tried to put a lot of that into our economic model. And so that higher sensitivity is already in our forecast, and the interest rate path that we would look at as part of a forecast would take that into account. But a model is just a model, and so we need to see the data in real time and see how consumption is is evolving, as well as how housing markets are evolving. And as you know, housing starts and other measures of activity fell off quite a lot at the beginning of the year and, and through the summer. We see that stabilizing and, uh, and also in price space. And so um, um, we think that it's kind of hit uh, a level that uh, that is stabilizing in many of the markets. And of course, the biggest changes were in the markets that had, that had the most adjustment to make. So the Greater Toronto Area and the Vancouver Area, uh, everybody everywhere else is, is a little bit, was already a little bit more stable. And so we'll keep an eye on these things. Um, you know, I think higher interest rates are always difficult when people haven't seen them for a long time. Um, but when they're coming at a time when the economy is growing and it's a sign that we're getting back to a more normal phase, in, in, in a lot of senses it's, it's good news. Uh, just with respect to the, the term gradual that, that you've discussed a little bit already, um, it's being, uh, I understand what you said, that it, uh, it opens, it, it allows the banks some flexibility to go at either a faster or a slower pace than you might otherwise. Um, it's being fairly widely interpreted as allowing the bank to go at a faster pace more specifically. Would you dispute that in interpretation? Would, or would you say that it's truly a neutral up or down decision? I, you know, what you say is exactly right, that it does uh, permit the flexibility to move at a faster pace. But that would be completely hypothetical depending on the data. And so it also permits us to go at a slower pace if the data suggests, for example, that the household sector is having difficulty digesting a higher rate of interest, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if the adjustments prove more abrupt than our model suggested, et cetera, then that would give us a reason to pause and, and assess longer. Uh, but, uh, you know, you, you start stacking up positive risks like, you know, uh, negotiated settlement to trade uh, trade actions between the U.S. and, and China and, you know, uh, let's let's remove the, the uh, steel and aluminum tariffs and, you know, so you start getting the good news flowing in. Uh, then, of course, the, you start looking care more carefully at the upper, upper side of those uh, distributions mm -hmm. and you'd want to be able to be flexible enough to have, mm -hmm. and in effect, Every one of our meetings is live, and as, as Ms. Wilkins said in the opening remarks, markets seem to have settled on uh, gradual, meaning we would only move every second meeting. To put it most bluntly, that's, that's what I heard from the street. And uh, we thought, well, we really don't want to reinforce that as a locked-in uh, mechanical ex ex expectation. And so this is serving notice that it could be faster or it could be slower. And you watch the same data we watch, so it won't be that hard to, to kind of make, make some educated uh, expectational guesses around that. Bruce Campion-Smith, Toronto Star. Hi, good morning. Thanks for this. Just to follow up on the, the question about um, the impact on households, I just wonder if you've done an assessment that as you move to perhaps a more neutral stance, you know, two, two and a half to three and a half, what, what would the impact of that be on perhaps households? You look at like whether, you know, is, is there sort of a, a group of homeowners out there that, that are, are quite exposed from a debt standpoint and that'll be a problem? 
So this is in effect what we we did in July, where we we we, we actually we didn't do. We didn't say this is what policy would do. I think we analyzed 100 basis points and 200. And 200. We, we analyzed 100 and 200 basis point moves, and we analyzed it across the full spectrum of of, de of credit debtors. Debtors. So uh, you know, if, and of course, as as Ms. Wilkins said a, me a moment ago, those up in the upper tier, you know, experience the the most uh, difficulty. But within that, it's not everybody because many have chosen the security of a five-year mortgage. And so there, you know, we have to analyze not just in blocks, but think, well, how many folks are renewing at a point in time as we go through, say, the next two or three years? And uh, some people, for instance, would be renewing at a lower rate than when they got their mortgage because of what's happened in between. So it's a very complex mm -hmm. question. I know it's very easy to find the example of someone who's, you know, on the cusp of this, and uh, we we don't dismiss. You know, this is this is a, a difficult adjustment uh, for people, no question about it. Uh, but it's it's you know it's precisely why uh, we've put in place a two percentage point stress test when getting a new mortgage, because everybody knew interest rates were lower than they would end up being. Uh, so it made perfect sense. We advocated it for quite a long time before it became practice uh, that people should be self-testing in this situation. But I think what's uh, most of the discussion is focused on um, accessibility or affordability of housing and, and how does the interest rate path normalization affect that. And I would just like to like everyone to bear in mind that, you know, a couple of years ago, we were seeing spec rampant speculation in, in a, at least two major housing markets, uh, which amount to a big percentage of Canada's housing market. Um, and so housing prices that are rising at 20 percent per year or more uh, are obviously uh, affecting housing affordability. Mm -hmm. And by far more than quarter point, half point, 100 basis points in, uh, in mortgage rates uh, even come close to doing. And so as we go to a more normal environment where housing is, let's just say, more normal, uh, where you, you don't hear about the bidding wars and prices aren't rising at 20 percent, et cetera, uh, you don't hear about uh, FOMO, fear of missing out, you know, I've got to get into the housing market now or I never get in. Those are the kinds of stories we we're hearing in that phase. So the, the array of, of policies that have put in place, both local, you know, as well as the, the B20 guidelines and the, uh, the, the you know, the, the interest rate actions we've taken, that combination has calmed that down quite a lot. And therefore, I think is actually contributing to housing affordability, uh, considering what, uh, what might have been the case uh, if none of that had occurred, hard to, Power to calculate, of course, but we can certainly imagine the house prices would be significantly above where they are today uh, in at least a couple of key markets. Um, and uh, in exchange, you know, we've got some new rules and we've got, you know, interest rates that are gently moving towards uh, uh, neutral. So um, anyway, that's, that's uh, more context around what it looks like. I get it that it's, it, it can be difficult for some, but it's, it's the reality is that the economy is running at its capacity and it, it is no longer needing stimulus. And so it's, it's our job to prevent the thing from overheating and creating inflation pressures down the road. And uh, so we don't have any, so we're in good shape. Uh, but we're watching it very closely. Do you want to add anything to that? or? Just, just, uh, just one thing, because okay. I think you raise a really good point, and this is this is important. We, we, we forget the counterfactuals are really hard to construct. Uh, at the same time, you can imagine that if house price growth and housing activity had continued on that that what we thought was an unsustainable pace, uh, that that uh, perhaps and we didn't have those rules, perhaps people may have been able to purchase those houses, but being so highly indebted, so highly levered at a time when there was a there might have been an even bigger possibility of a house a, a sharp house price decline, 
uh, wouldn't have been very helpful for housing affordability uh, for households either because uh, if you've just got a mortgage and you're highly indebted and, and you become underwater, uh, that's not a very happy situation to be in either. And so the, to the extent that, that we see less evidence of speculation and we see better quality of new mortgages, I think we're, we're on more solid footing in terms of resilience of, of the economy, and that translates into resilience of people's incomes. Steve Shearwaters. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about um, the possible sort of headwinds for the Canadian economy. One, one of them is uh, how much of a drag on the economy uh, does the Bank of Canada see uh, with the low prices of, uh, of Canadian heavy crude? Is that, is that, I mean, you know, how do you see that developing and, and, and how is that affecting uh, growth? So, so clearly, so clearly, uh, that is subtracting, that is subtracting uh, something from growth. As you know, the the big gap between WCS and WTI is a function of a number of things, uh, including transportation barriers. Some of the other things are a little bit uh, more temporary, shut shutdowns, and we expect those to, to come back. And so, and so, uh, nonetheless, we we think although the gap's especially wide right now, it, it should narrow a little bit uh, over the coming quarters. Uh, on the other hand, Brent and, and is a little bit higher than we had last July. Overall, when you look at the whole commodity space, it is weaker, and so it's shaving off uh, a bit from from uh, Canadian growth relative to uh, what we had in July, maybe 0.1 or so, and so it provides a, it some of an offset to the good news that's coming from the USMCA. And if I could follow up in, in, um, in the monetary uh, policy announcement this morning, um, you said the U.S. economy is especially robust and is expected to moderate uh, over the projection horizon. When do you see the sort of U.S. economy peaking? Do you, do you see it already sort of coming down, you know, sort of uh, slowing now, or is that coming up? Yeah, so so uh, so the big cycle in the U.S. growth and the strength now is coming uh, from the, from the fiscal stimulus, among among other things. And so the pattern of growth that we have in our forecast uh, is really uh, a function of that. How we see the, the fiscal policy in the U.S. Uh, continuing. So growth slows quite a lot, uh, leading out to 2020, with a little bit of slowing in 2019. So I believe growth is the strongest in 2018. Of course, we uh, always uh, stay true to what actually has been announced in terms of fiscal policy, whether it's in Canada or in any other country. And so it's possible that there's more fiscal stimulus coming from the U.S. or less. We don't know. And we would have to take that into account in, in future uh, projections of the U.S. economy. But I, I talked a little bit about the fiscal as if that's the only thing, but it's hard to disagree entangle that from how uh, the U.S. economy seems to um, be exhibiting some animal spirits that we've been talking about for a while. I mean, at one point, you get into this you know, virtuous circle where businesses uh, have good demand and they become more confident and they invest more. And we're seeing that, that uh, virtuous cycle right now. Uh, and so uh, that, um, that's what's really uh, pushing up growth this year and, and into next. Okay, and we have uh, time for one more question from Yali NDI from Market News. Um, thank you. I just wanted to uh, get back to the gradual and this, uh, in your speech in September, um, you said that the, the governing council had discussed not the word, but the approach, mm -hmm. the gradual approach, and that was, uh, and whether it was appropriate given that the economy had been running at potential for, for a year or so. Um, and so this sounds like it's not because you want to avoid just an impression. It sounds like you wanted to say, well, the approach itself might not be appropriate given the stage we are at. Um, can you explain why now it's because the explanation has changed? Sure. Um, so, uh, so it is appropriate now, given the stage we're at, to have the flexibility that the governor talked about. 
to either go faster or to either go slower and really pay close attention to the data because we are at potential and we do have inflation at target. You remember at, in September there was an additional element uh, that was there, which is the fact that the data we had seen so far on inflation uh, was was closer to the upper end of the of the target band. And we were very confident, as I said then in the staff analysis, that, that was temporary and that it would come down. But any good central banker is going to is going to uh, look at that data pretty carefully and and uh, assign a higher weight to it coming down when it actually happens. And so we've seen inflation go from 2.8 percent in in uh, August to 2.2 percent in September. Uh, that has validated the staff analysis. Okay, and uh, the other question was, uh, I understand you reach your decisions by consensus and not a vote, but in your discussions, was there a point that was, uh, for which it was harder to reach a consensus this time? We can both. We, we were both in the room, so maybe I can say something. You can say something. Sure. You know, it's it's interesting because I think every time uh, the discussions uh, involve a bit of debate, not because we're not having a consensus, but because we're t kicking the tires, and so we like to play devil's advocate. And and uh, this time, in fact, the things that that I talked about in the opening statement were things that we that we discussed the most. How much of the uncertainty should we take off? Uh, with respect to the USMCA, uh, all of it, um, none of it. Should we wait? You know, and that was the point of discussion there. Uh, with respect to the the housing market and the and the household uh, imbalances, it was really a question of of. Uh, Looking for the evidence we needed to make the statements that we think it's stabilizing and that and that we see the quality of debt uh, is improving, and then of course with respect to gradual, I think I've said everything uh, that that there is to say on that. That just really reflects the conversation that we had in the room. Well, I don't think I have anything to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in that note, we wrap up our news conference. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you.